You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is Brian McClanahan. This is episode 26. So here we are halfway through our year, first year of the podcast for the Abbeville Institute. Really excited about this and glad to have you with us. Uh, we have a couple of things to talk about before we get into the material for the week. Don't forget we have our summer school in June, June 12th through 17th, 2016, in Charleston, South Carolina. Actually, uh, it's in Seabrook Island, South Carolina, near Charleston, though, at the beach. And uh, it'll be a great time. It's um, a, a very interesting topic, uh, the South and the renewal of America, and um, what the Southern tradition can offer to America today. And I think this is something we, we have to think about moving forward. What can the past offer the future? And particularly, what can the Southern past offer the future? It's a very positive outlook on what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. So if you want to go, uh, I think there still are a few slots available. It's running out. Time's running out to get in. And uh, so contact uh, Dr. Livingston. The information is on our website. And then we have a brand new event. Uh, we're really excited about this. August 13th, 2016, a brand new conference Nullification, a 21st Century Remedy, uh, will be held in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we have six speakers confirmed for the event. It's a one-day event on August 13th, um, 10 to 3, on that Saturday. You will get lunch out of it. So uh, information is on our website, but uh, we've got uh, really good speakers lined up. Dr. Livingston, myself, uh, Honorable uh, Judge, uh, Judge Rusty Johnston, and he'll be talking about how the state courts can resist unconstitutional federal legislation. We have a representative from the Tenth Amendment Center, Mike Meharry, uh, who will talk about uh, modern nullification efforts and some things that are going on currently. Uh, Jeffrey Atticott, uh, who's an attorney, uh, will be there talking about uh, nullification, again, the legal, legal uh, underpinnings of nullification. And uh, Kent Matcherson Brown, who is also a, a, an attorney, will talk about the compact Theory, he says in his talk, but I say it's the compact fact of the Constitution. So I'll be discussing conventions and uh, the history of conventions and why they're an important process in this entire uh, position of nullification, how we should be using nullification if it's going to work. And uh, Dr. Livingston will be talking about what is an American state and getting to this idea of what our state's rights. So it's going to be a great conference. Uh, again, information is on our website. We'd love to see you out there in Atlanta. We'd love to see you in uh, our summer school in, in June. So a couple of events coming up, and we will have one more for the year uh, in October. We don't have all the details exactly set out yet, So, but there's going to be another one in October, and this one will be in Texas. So we're coming to Texas and uh, looking forward to all these things. All right, so uh, remember that also that the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions, uh, which are tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. Um, most of what we do uh, is, uh, is only exists because you help us out. Uh, and so the website, the podcast, these conferences, all of these things require funds. And so if you enjoy this podcast, if you enjoy the material on the website, if you enjoy uh, getting to go to a conference, and of course we record these and put them up on the website, if you enjoy that type of material, uh, please contribute to the Abbeville Institute. Uh, so information to that, to that extent is also on our website under um, support. And um, please check out that and uh, make a contribution if you've not already done so. All right, so we've got uh, six things to talk about this week. Normally we only have five, but um, we ran a piece on Mother's Day, which didn't get included in the last podcast. And it's a long piece, Women of the Southern Confederacy, written by Albert Taylor Bledsoe. Um, Albert Taylor Bledsoe is an interesting individual. Um, this piece was written actually in 1877. And he ran a literary magazine called the Southern Review with his daughter. And it was, and still is, one of the best literary magazines that the South has ever produced. And Bledsoe <clears throat> wrote the best defense of secession after the war, entitled uh, is Davis a traitor, where he talked about the idea of secession and how Davis was not a traitor. In fact, he he wrote the book, and his 
in his interpretation, to defend Jefferson Davis if Davis ever went to trial, which Davis never did go to trial. So, uh, But it's a phenomenal book if you want to read How to Defend Secession and the fact that secession was not treason, Davis was not a traitor, this was the American position, and there's a very funny chapter in that particular book entitled uh, Webster versus Webster, where <laughs> where Davis point uh, I'm sorry Bledsoe points out that Daniel Webster at one time was in favor of secession, then he wasn't in favor of secession. So uh, you know he, he points out the hypocrisy of the northern position that secession is actually treason when the North advocated it too at, for much of their history. It's only later that they said it was uh, illegal. But this particular piece is interesting because it talks about the sacrifices that women made in this four-year struggle for Southern independence. And a lot of people don't think about this. Uh, and in fact, you can look at this. They don't think about this even in the American War for Independence in 1776 and the hardships that people had to go through to win independence. The difference is, as Bledsoe points out, the, in the American War for Independence, the United States won. In the Southern War for Independence, the South lost. So the sacrifices that Southern women made were not rewarded as they were in uh, 1776 to 1783, or 1775 to 1783. Those sacrifices were rewarded with independence. The South, though, lost. And people wonder, I mean, this is the whole idea of, you know, the lost cause. Uh, people wonder why Southerners were so interested in telling their story of the war because of the sacrifices that they made. I mean, you have to understand that the people that suffered through this war and lost, they lost everything. It wasn't just a matter of uh, property, uh, which they did lose uh, in, in, ver in various ways. It was also the matter that three-quarters of the uh, white male population in the South fought in the war. Three-quarters, 75%. So everyone had a family member that was fighting. And the death toll was tremendous. Uh, it was a real hardship. The entire infrastructure of the South was destroyed. The economy was wrecked. Now, there was no capital in the South. I mean, this was a very sad time following the war. And the sacrifices that people made during the war, they didn't want people to forget this. And so, of course, this week in South Carolina was uh, Confederate Memorial Day on May 10th. And uh, people didn't want to forget and that's what this entire piece is about. And I think when people start using that pejorative as it's used now, the lost cause, uh, they're forgetting the sacrifices that Southerners made, men and women. Uh, they're forgetting that the entire economy in the South was wrecked and that the hardships were spread across the entire Southern population, white and black. Uh, that even during the war, uh, black Southerners suffered too uh, because of the economic dislocation. This was a hard time. Uh, one of the pieces this week is written by uh, Karen Stokes, and she's written a, a great book about how uh, black Southerners suffered during Sherman's march through South Carolina. And then this is kind of the untold story, the lost story. We, we had a piece a long time ago by Paul Graham uh, talking about you know slave narratives and what they suffered when the, the Union Army came marching through South Carolina. Um, so this, this entire process of Reconstruction, the end of the war, was horrible. Uh, and it, Bledsoe brings, first starts with a book uh, that was written at the time about the Lee family and Arlington and the ultimate suffering that the Lee family went through, particularly uh, Mrs. Lee, and losing Arlington House. I mean, people don't talk about this. Uh, everyone goes to Arlington now, and it's a wonderful place and very solemn place. Uh, you know, you have the great tomb of the unknown soldier, and so people go there and they, they pay their respects. But what they don't often realize is that was illegally seized from the Lee family, and the soldiers that were buried there were were buried there to spite the Lees. Uh, so uh, it, it was it was confiscated illegally by the general government, and this house was directly tied to George Washington. And the fact that the property was ransacked during the war and uh, that uh, Montgomery Meigs wanted to put uh, dead soldiers in, in the front lawn because they wanted to forever uh, spite the Lee family. 
I mean, that's the lost part of Arlington House and the lost part of Arlington, the lost story of Arlington, uh, Arlington history and Arlington Cemetery. I mean, this was directly related to George Washington. And so I think sometimes we forget that, how important that house was to the fabric of American history, the artifacts that were in the, the house that were stolen by the Union soldiers and Union occupiers of the property. Uh, and then how Mrs. Lee never got her property back. Uh, and she was uh, she was invalid. She was crippled during the war and uh, suffered because of that. And yet uh, never complained, really, about the loss of her property. Even people uh, who were not in favor of the Lees at one point said, you know, they need to get, she needs to get her house back. But of course, the general government was not going to do that. This was their, this was their prize. This was their spoils of war, Arlington House. And now that it had dead soldiers planted in the front yard, of course it wasn't going to be given back. So when you go to Arlington, if you ever do get a chance to go to Arlington, remember that. Remember that this house was illegally seized by the general government during the war. And, uh, it's a trophy. It's a solemn place, certainly, today, but it's a trophy of war. And it belongs to the Lee family. It should still belong to the Lee family. Uh, but of course, in our, in our current purge of anything uh, related to the South and Southern history, and uh, con particularly Confederate history, I mean, there's no way that that's ever going to be uh, made popular that position that this was stolen from the Lee family. It's a rightful confiscation, and uh, because those Lees were traitors, just like uh, you know, in Washington and Lee University, you can't have in the chapel dedicated to Robert E. Lee. You can't have any more flags in the chapel because that might offend some people. I mean, this is Robert E. Lee. <laughs> uh, so it's just amazing how how this process is go is ongoing. And um, we've I've said before in this podcast, we've said on the website. It's not going to stop. And the, the, these low-hanging fruit flags and even monuments, I mean, this is only the beginning. Uh, and eventually, if you, if you can take the flags out of the Lee Chapel there in, uh, in the, the tomb there at Washington Lee University, then anything is fair game. And uh, you know, we, we're seeing this now. Uh, eventually, uh, I think that... Um, in the next 10 years, unless there's some kind of stop to this, which, I mean, it could, it could peter out, but I don't think it will because the progressive left is never going to stop. Uh, actually, I, there was a very interesting quote uh, that I saw uh, this week about this whole idea and why the progressive left will never stop. And in fact, they were, they were very open about this uh, in an article. It was, um, it was an open letter to Hillary Clinton and um, in this particular letter, it was, it was in uh, the, the week, and this author, his name was Damon Linker, and he said, isn't it a tenet of progressivism that America isn't already great? That our national greatness is always a work in progress, a goal achieved only in the fullness of time? I mean, that's, that's stunning that he outright admitted that the America is only great within the confines of their head. And this is exactly what's happening with this purge of Southern symbols. America won't be great, they think, until these things are gone. And then when they're gone, well, America still won't be great because the fullness of time has not, re has not realized the greatness of America. So once we get rid of Confederate flags and Confederate symbols and statues, then we're going to have to go after those pesky founding fathers who were all Southern racist slaveholders, or you know, people like Jefferson and Washington and Madison and Monroe. I mean, they're going to have to be purged in some way. Uh, and so we're going to get rid of them. Uh, and, and you know, the way sites found, uh, of the founding generation are being interpreted, interpreted is already going through this. They're already being recontextualized to focus on not the greatness of the men who live there, but the labor force that was at these particular places. And that's all we're going to talk about when you go to, say, Monticello or Montpelier. I mean, th this is it. So it's, it's stunning that he, that he outright said this, Damon Linker. And this is the whole tenet of the fanaticism of the North before the war, 
which most Northerners did not support, in fact, the vast majority, and all reform movements that we've seen throughout American history. That's progressivism. It, the greatness only exists within the confines of their head. This is, this is Emerson and Thoreau. This is what they were talking about. This is transcendentalism. And it's important to know that because if you, if you firmly, if you know that this is the case, they'll, they'll never stop. So you have to say no. You just have to tell them no. And you have to keep getting the next generation to tell them no and the next generation to tell them no. Make them lose. Because what's happening is well, and well-meaning people are saying, well, yeah, I mean, we can see their point on some things, and so we're going to give in on this one. And then they'll take the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and they won't stop. That is progressivism. And so by putting a piece out there about women in the Confederacy and this lost cause, Bledsoe was often, there was a book that came out in 2014 about Bledsoe, you know, the architect of the lost cause. Now, somehow this is just a myth. I mean, that's the whole, there's just a myth here. This whole idea of the lost cause, there's nothing to it. Those traitors in the South deserved it. The Lee family deserved to have their plantation stolen from them. They deserved it. It's silly. And, of course, the suffering that the Lee family went through, and not just the Lee family, but the, entire, the women of the entire South. And Bledsoe concludes this piece. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a very long piece. A lot of um, uh, primary material here that uh, Bledsoe cites, letters. Um, he, he quotes a couple of things that I think are interesting. One was by R.M.T. Hunter. Uh, Hunter said after the war, I think it may be shown that no people ever encountered greater difficulties with greater courage and patience than did our southern people in the recent contest. Let its history be fairly written, and I believe the world will accord with me. But in commemorating the deeds of, and self-denial of the men, we must not forget the women. When did they ever fail to respond promptly to any demand which was made upon them for food or raiment or anything they could furnish our men in the field? And how many instances did they rebuke desertion? Or when they, were, when they heard to complain of any sacrifice necessarily imposed upon them by the war? It was one, of the, uh, was one of the last acts of the war when the Confederate government appealed to the women of Virginia for food and for the soldier. How cheerfully was it given? And how many instances did the women say upon examining her stores, I and my family will live upon the bread, let the soldier have the meat? Several federal officers were quartered in a southern woman's house, and one of them said to her one day, Madam, you astonish me. Your slaves are deserting you or being spirited away daily. Your barns are sacked. Your farm is wasted. Your team's taken away. Your stock destroyed, and yet you make no complaint. How is this? And this woman responded, Sir, you do not understand the feelings of our southern women in their estimation of the cause for which you are making them suffer. I lost my husband not very long ago. He owed his life to his country, and nobly he paid the debt, dying fighting as he did in the field. I shed no tear over him. And do you suppose I would mourn over property when I make no moan over him? When I lost him, I lost my all. My sex forbids me to take his place in the ranks. I cannot fight, but I can endure. That's a tremendous statement. And Bledsoe concludes this piece, Shall we close with bare allusion to woman's sacrifice upon her country's shine, shrine of all the littleness of her sex as regards personal adornment, or still more to how she, to show her ingenuity and taste, triumphed over the perplexities of the situation? And she learned to plait straw, weave, spin, and manufacture gloves and shoes with a neatness and dexterity surprising to herself? All the gifts and graces with which she was endowed by nature and education were called in requisition to serve a cause she loved so well. And when hope had fled, and all her sacrifices seemed proven to have been in vain, who so ready to submit to the humiliations of the hour, to part unmurmingly with the attendance to which she had been accustomed from infancy, and to work with her hands, head, any way, to aid in building up again the fortunes of her stricken land? To her keeping, too, has been committed 
as if by common consent, the guarding of the dust of those who died for their country. And many a beautiful monument throughout the land attests her estimate of the sacredness of the trust. Even in this cursory view of the subject, has it not been made plain that the women of the late Confederacy were in no whit behind their noble predecessors of revolutionary fame and piety, patriotism, heroism, and long-suffering? Shame will it be, then, to the southern women of the present day, if, under the mere auspices of peace, they prove unworthy of such glory, glorious antecedents. Let them rather verify the eulogy which has been pronounced upon them by lips unused to flatter. Faithful amongst the faithless, faithful amongst the faithless, excuse me, are the women of the South. So a call in 1877 for women of the day to remember the women of the past. And here we are over a hundred years later. The same call is there. On Monday we ran a piece, Defended the Death. This is a little piece about political correctness and how it used to be said that uh, I will defend to the death your right to say it even if I disagree with what you're saying. And now that's not the case. Now it's I disagree with what you're saying, so you must be silenced. You must shut up. Uh, and if you if you oppose the progressive agenda, this gets into this whole idea of progressivism, if you oppose the progressive agenda in any ways, well, then you're just a racist. That's the term that's being thrown out there. If you oppose global warming, you know, you're a racist. Uh, if, you pro, if you oppose anything in the progressive agenda, you're a racist. If you, if you support the Constitution, you're a racist because you know, and this was actually, I, I saw an, uh, a talk, the Constitution is racist. If you support that, you're a racist. I mean, this is the, the term that's used now. This is political correctness. If you oppose any of these things, you're a racist. Anything that's going on in the modern society, well, you're just a racist. And that's a way to silence opposition. It's not about free thinking and free discussion. And uh, there was actually a piece in the New York Times uh, last week uh, on Sunday that talked about this, the liberal intolerance, and how they have no tolerance for any other position. And it's not, they don't even think about the other position being worthy or, or, or uh, worthy of their uh, thought. It's, it's just beneath them. This is liberal arrogance and liberal intolerance, or progressive arrogance and progressive intolerance. As I said, as that quote pointed out, they will never stop until the fullness of time realizes their position. It's utopian ideology. It's silly. You can look at all the utopian experiments in American history and find that they didn't work. But now what's happening, they're not just confining themselves to Oneida or Brook Farm. Now what they're doing is saying the United States is their utopian experiment. The South is the first step in their utopian experiment, and they will look at the entire United States. Uh, President Obama said that he was going to continue remaking America in 2009, and that's happened. That's happened. Everything that's going on now is because of this idea that America had to be remade. It only, the greatness of America is, you know, Michelle Obama said, I'm, for the first time in my life, I'm proud of America. Because in her mind, between the two sides of her skull, nothing was good. And it was only by remaking things that they were better. But nothing is ever better. If you hear them speak today, nothing, nothing's better. We still have more work to do. There's more work to do for this and that. More work to do for here. More work to do for there. We got to take care of this. We got to get rid of that. We got to change this. If you understand the progressive mind, then you'll understand that they have to be told, no, they're like children. I mean, progressives really are like children. They have to be told no. Because if they're not told no, then they're just going to take, take, take. I think that's, you know, progressivism is, is an adolescent ideology. And uh, it, it, you, they have to be told by the adults, no. And in this particular case, when you talk about, you know, statues and symbols, they have to be told no, because their feelings are hurt for some reason that you can't determine, but their feelings are hurt, and so, uh, you know, like a kindergartner, they're going to they're gonna cry and pout, and you just have to tell the kindergartner no. You'll get over it, but that's not what we do anymore. We tell them, oh, it's okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll change that for you because your feelings are hurt, and then when they cry again about something else, 
then we have to help them there. And then, and then their whole life they're being appeased because they cried and they got their way. You have to tell them no. On Tuesday, uh, we published a piece, Remember Us, by Herbert Chambers. Uh, this was a speech delivered on May 6, 2016 in, in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. It's a fantastic, fantastic talk about why Confederate soldiers should be remembered. And he begins with a poem. And uh, it's, it's about the lost soldier. And this is a wonderful poem. And it, it starts, we were young, we have died, remember us. We have done what we could, but until it is finished, it is not done. We have given our lives, but until it is finished, no one can know what our lives gave. Our deaths are not ours. They are yours. They will mean what you make them. Whether for peace, a new hope, or nothing, we cannot say. It is you who must say this. We leave you our deaths, give them their meaning. We were young, we have died, remember us. And so what Chambers is saying is we need to give the Confederate dead their meaning. One side, the progressive left, has given them a meaning. We have to define their meaning. And for a hundred years, the South defined their meaning and what they gave their lives for. And, of course, people will say, well, that's just lost cause mythology. Those monuments that say we fought for states' rights and the true Constitution, that's not what they were fighting for. As even <laughs> establishment historians have pointed out, like James McPherson, yeah, well, I mean, that's they were fighting for that. I mean, you wouldn't find many who would, I mean, there were some who openly said, we're fighting for our slave property. There were some that said that. Absolutely. But to, the, to a man, most of them said, we're fighting for our independence. If the, if the Yankees would stop, stop fighting us, we'd stop fighting them. It's about independence. I mean, the British said the uh, Americans in 1776 were fighting for slavery, too. As I told a colleague one time, good thing the Brits didn't win then. Because they would have been able to define what the war was about. But we've defined it because we won. In this particular case, the South lost, so they were never able to define the war. Or they could for a time. Now they can't. And even in the 1880s, they recognized that this was going to happen. And they were imploring people, please, please define the war. Define why we died. Remember us. Define why your fathers and your brothers, in some cases your sons, why they died. Remember them. If you don't define it, the other side will. And if they define it, their cause is going to be nothing but tra treason, traitors. And you still see this to this day. You go on, quote-unquote, Civil War websites that are run by a bunch of uh, Yankees, and they'll tell you, oh, Lee was just a traitor. He's worthless. These people are worthless. So that, that position is still out there. And I think more pronounced now than ever before. Even, <laughs> even in uh, the years after the war, when Union and Confederate soldiers were still alive, they didn't have that position. Union soldiers didn't have that position. They shook hands. They talked about the war, and they understood each other. And those Union soldiers weren't calling Johnny Reb traitors. Worthy opponents, real Americans, who had a dispute over the meaning of something. That's what they said after the war was over, the actual soldiers themselves. So Mr. Chambers says, we are here because we will not make that unthinkable sacrifice of the truth of our soldiers and people. We will not allow their deaths to be defined as anything but what they truly were, noble and heroic, as a sublime expression of the commandments of our revolutionary forefathers. We will not remain silent and allow fallacious condemnations to go unchallenged, especially when those criticisms come from those in this day who have orchestrated and condemned the collapse in our society of things decent, honorable, moral, and civil, and yet have the sanctimonious gall to think that they somehow have the moral authority and superiority to judge a past generation of principled, selfless, 
God-fearing people. This is a wonderful speech, and it's, it's, it's long. And he talks about the meaning of Confederate symbols, which we've talked about in this podcast several times. But I highly recommend you go out and read it. He quotes uh, Richard Weaver in the Southern Tradition at Bay. Richard Weaver says, Although the judgment of history went against them, it is difficult to establish a moral scheme by which they may be condemned. In both personal and public morality, they were at least the equal of their foes. And as for the political crime of disunion, which the North sought relentlessly to fix on them, it is plain that the, that the letter of the law was on their side. Which is true. So I go out and read this, and it's about the cause for which they they fought. And it's about teaching Southern history. On Wednesday, Karen Stokes ran a piece, Don't Leave Me Here to Bleed to Death, that talked about a, a picture from from uh, Gettysburg that actually had uh, Confederate soldiers with headstones. And you didn't see this often. But she talks about the man, William Calvin Butler, who was a private in the 3rd South Carolina Infantry Regiment. He was born in Newberry County. Um, And the scenes that people saw in this war, the horrible scenes... Uh, people who were suffering for a cause, for independence, and the things they were willing to do. And there's a quote in this particular piece, and it's a direct quote from the aftermath of the war. And this comes from uh, a book entitled uh, History of Kershaw's Brigade by D. Augustus Dickert, published in 1899. And in this particular book, Dickert recounts this scene. Quote, Just in the rear of where Colonel Nance fell, I saw one of the saddest sights I almost ever witnessed. A soldier from Company C, 3rd South Carolina, a young soldier, just verging into manhood, had been shot in the first advance, the bullet severing the great artery of the thigh. The young man seeing his danger of bleeding to death before succor could possibly reach him, had struggled behind a small sapling. Bracing himself against it, he undertook deliberate measures for saving his life. Tying a handkerchief above the wound, placing a small stone underneath and just above, just over the artery, and putting a stick between the handkerchief and his leg, he began to tighten by twisting the stick around. But too late. Life had fled, leaving both hands clasping the stick, his eyes glassy and fixed. So here's a young man, shot in the leg, trying to save his own life, maybe 18, 19 years old. And we forget about that. I mean, these men have just become traitors. They're demons. I mean, as we saw in Abraham Lincoln vampire slayers, they're, they're, uh, they're not even human. They're not human. That's the worst. People ask me several times, you know, what's the worst movie that you know, demonizes the South? I think that's one of them. Because Southerners now, it's not even human. They're just vampires. And Lincoln is some mythical figure that's going to slay vampires. They're not people. They're not Americans. They're demons. On Thursday, ran a piece by Thomas Bryant, which was entitled A Christian Defense of the South. And he calls to account that Um, You can look at uh, Christianity in the South in the same way in terms of defending the two and how you have, um, he says, history is not written by the victors. It's also simplified by the victors so it can be taught to children. One does not 
not need to be more Machiavellian than to understand the motive of northern historical proponents for silencing or ignoring data that contradicts their narrative of the war. And he says, this is the same thing that was faced by biblical scholars and Christian apologists concerning the historical veracity of the New Testament and even the existence of Jesus. And one of the numerous reasons the stories found in the New Testament are trusted as accurate history is that they were written so close to the events depicted by people who were in a position to know the truth of the matter. And so he says, you can do this with Southern history too. There's plenty of information out there from people who were so close to the matter, and this is what we should pay attention to. Not history is written, written years after the war that says, well, no, this is what it was all about. This is what soldiers were saying uh, you know, this, this is what we think it was about. They were just traitors. He says that uh, you know, several times, even mainstream figures have said, you know, th that they the war to them is what the North has said the war is, not what the people at the time, or even right after the war, said the war was. And so that's something that it's it's again very important why we do things at the Abbeville Institute. Our goal is not just the war, because the war was an outgrowth, an extension of Jeffersonian America. The reason the South thought they could secede in 1861 is because the principles, the American principles that were there had been there long before. Is Davis a traitor? No. Northerners started talking about secession in 1794 because they thought they could do it. In 1794, then they talked about it again in 1800, then they talked about it again in 1803, then they talked about it again in 1815. So the North was pursuing secession long before the South ever, ever thought about it. But that's not something we think about. We think that the South was somehow creating something out of thin air that they could secede from the Union. Secession was something that was openly discussed many times before 1860 and 61. But yet, we think it's some new theory that the South created out of thin air. That is the Southern tradition. It's the Jeffersonian tradition. Of course, Jefferson was from the South. This tradition of self-determination, of real federalism. The North wanted real federalism, too, for a long time. It's just by the time they had the reins of government in their hands, they didn't want real federalism anymore because that, that would destroy what they wanted, which was a national economic system and political economic system, I should say. And as we pointed out, you know, the North was just as racist as the South. So there's no moral superiority there. And finally, on Friday, we had a great piece by Clyde Wilson. In fact, he said this is one of his favorite pieces that he's ever written. It's entitled The Imperial and Momentary We. And he talks about how Americans being a practical people is actually a bad thing in some ways. They... Uh, you know, Americans, he says, are a practical people. They don't want to hear your theory. They want to know what works. This aversion to systematic thinking, American pragmatism, has been celebrated as a virtue in a world cursed by ideology. And by golly, this approach has worked and worked well in some aspects of our national life. But he says this is actually a problem because Americans then are people of the moment, the now. The now is more important. They don't have any anchor to the past or to things the way they worked before. This is what, when the Constitution was written in Philadelphia, this is what, uh, when John Dickinson said, uh, experience must be our only guide, reason may mislead us. They were worried about innovations. And what they meant by innovations were things that had never been tried before and nobody knew if they would work. That's what they were concerned with. So the Constitution, what they were building there, this is why when people say this is the Constitution was a, was a compromise between large states and small states. No, 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 that's not right. It was a compromise between nationalists and real federalists. The people that wanted to preserve the federal union, people like Roger Sherman and 
John Dickinson and John Rutledge, what they wanted to ensure was that the states would not be crushed by a national government. It's not large states and small states. It's nationalists and federalists. And so what you have in the original Constitution, the Senate was the federal part of that document because the states were represented in the Senate. And if you look at the document itself, they had all the power. The Senate has all the power in reality. They check the executive branch, and they check the legislative branch, and they check the judicial branch because they get to determine if those judges get to sit on the bench. They get to, de they get to determine things like treaties, yes or no, which is the president can write treaties, but they're not ratified until the Senate says yes. The Senate gets to check the House of Representatives, which is national. But the Senate checks them because they have to concur on all bills. So if you look at the fundamental structure of the Constitution, the Senate really has all the power. That's often lost in our understanding of the Constitution. And that was a resistance to innovation. This is what Clyde's talking about here. For years, we used to resist innovations because we had to stop and think about them. This is Chesterton's fence. Why is the fence there? The fence is there to do something that was bad to keep it from happening again. But now we just rip out the fence because we're the momentary we. We don't like that fence. We're going to get rid of it. Who cares why the fence was there? It doesn't need to be there anymore because I don't like it. But why did we have that fence in the first place? That should be the first question. Not just rip it out because we think it's bad because the momentary we says it's good to get rid of it. This is what the Southern tradition is. It's that fence. The fence is being ripped apart piece by piece, plank by plank, because the momentary we says this is what we want. Again, they're adolescents. You have to tell them no. You have to tell them no. They're kindergartners. Progressives really are kindergartners. The whole idea of kindergarten actually comes from progressives too, but they're kindergartners. You have to tell them no because they're going to cry and they're going to pout about it if they don't get their way, and they won't stop unless you tell them no a bunch and they realize that they can't do anything about it. Now, of course, they use the court system to help enforce their wishes, which the adults in the room can stop the courts from doing that too, but they have to know that they can do that. And I don't think people realize that enough. And that's actually our, our conference on nullification. This is what uh, we're going to talk about. One of, the, one of the presentations, I believe, is going to talk about that. You know, the whole federal court apparatus could be destroyed by the Congress if people just knew that and insisted that their congressmen tell those federal, federal judges, those progressive federal judges who are adolescents, no. And actually, uh, you know, Clyde brings this up that now because a, a federal judge says something, they suddenly discover rights out of thin air nobody had thought about in a thousand years of legal history. Well, because they said it, the momentary we, and because our feelings are important, this is emotivism. If you, if you listen to how people talk about laws today, it's not, it's, it's emotion. Well, I feel this law will do this. Th this. This thing hurts my feelings, so it has to go. It's all about emotion. This is a very dangerous thing, emotion. There's no reason. There's no logic. There's no tradition. I mean, even, even Dickens saying reason may mislead us, yeah. But the important thing is tradition. I mean, I would take reason over emotion when it comes to making legislation because... Uh, emotion is dangerous because it's the feeling, it's progressivism. It feels bad. So think about that when these things come up. Southern symbols, Southern tradition, Southern history. What can Southern tradition offer? It's a, it's a hard sell because now everything is based on the momentary we. Everything is based on feeling. Tradition is not feeling. Tradition is not the moment. Tradition is something tangible and real, something that people have done. And I think if anything's going to happen out of this current shift in the political climate, which is happening in 2016, 
you've got two real interesting currents going on. You have one current that's trying to tear everything down and one current that's saying, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to keep or make America great again. You've got two currents pushing against each other. And one thing you can get out of that is what makes America great, and that is the Southern tradition. If you look at American history, the South is America. You know, Daniel Boone is America. That's the Southern tradition. The rugged individualist spirit, as we've talked about in this podcast several times, that is America. And that's what should be preserved. Not some uh, crazy notion of the momentary we, of something that has to be realized of the fullness of time. It's destructive. That is destructive. And so if we're going to preserve anything, we have to really do it in our homes. We can't find it, as, as Clyde talks about in his piece, you can't find it in politicians. You won't find it in a political movement. It's not political. It's, it's cultural. It's traditional. You have to find it at home and in your small communities. And uh, the only way to do that is to start small. Uh, I think some people are realizing this, and there's, there's some push out there to start creating communities that think alike. And uh, communities of people that have similar ideas about life and society. They're essentially seceding from society at large and saying, no, that's not us. We're not going to do that anymore. You can take it and shove it because we're just not going to be a part of that anymore. And this is the wonderful thing about this podcast and our website. And again, please help us if you can. Because essentially, by listening to this and reading our material, you're saying no to the momentary we. You're saying no to the progressive mentality. You're keeping the fence up. And if you can keep the fence up long enough and defend that fence, maybe and the, the onslaught is unrelenting. It won't stop, but you have to keep defending it. And your children have to keep defending it. And their grandchildren have to keep defending it. Because if you let them take one plank, they will take the entire fence down. This is not hyperbole. This has been proven over time. One plank leads to another plank, and the fence is gone. You let the overlords in D.C. take one plank from the Constitution, concede one position on them, and they will take the entire document. This is true. It already, it's already happened. The Constitution's already been shredded. Federalism is already gone. But the important part of that is the posts of the fence are still under the ground. They're still there. Maybe the posts of the fence are still standing. The fence is gone, but the posts are still up. And where are the posts? They're the states. As it was said several times in the ratification of the Constitution, they're the pillars. So the posts are still available. It's the states. And if the people of the states decide that they're going to say no to all of this stupidity, they can do it. And that is the Southern tradition. Until next time, good day. <laughs>